When you study the stories of Abraham, Moses, and Joshua, it wasn't about what they did. Their confidence was deposited in who God is. Sing with me. This sermon was recorded prior to the COVID-19 isolation mandate. So if you have your Bibles, I would ask that you turn to Nehemiah chapter 9. If you don't have your Bibles, they're in the pews in front of you. And Nehemiah chapter 9 is just left of center uh, in your Bibles. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 7 these words. I do not do what I want to do, but what I hate to do, this I keep on doing. Have you ever experienced one of those moments in your life? Even after your conversion, have you ever experienced that that reality that the very good that you want to do, you don't do, and the very thing you actually hate doing, this you keep on doing? Have you ever had those moments in the Christian life? No, it's just me and one other guy. Yeah, we've, we've had those moments. Those moments where you pray and you say, Lord, I will never, ever do that again. I promise you. I've learned my lesson. Only a few days or a few weeks later to find yourself doing the very thing that you swore with an oath you would never do again. When we look into Nehemiah chapter 9, we see that story played out over and over. And the reality is we can get stuck in a place in our Christian lives, in our spiritual walk with God, where we're trying to work hard in our own efforts and we're missing all of what he does for us, in us, and through us. The Christian life isn't about you doing for God. It begins with the understanding at the cross of what he has done for you. And the Christian life is lived out by the life of Christ at work within us. And Nehemiah chapter 9 is a reminder of that. Let me just set the context. A couple weeks ago, we were looking at chapter 8. And we had noticed that in the seventh month after the walls have been restored, a revival breaks out amongst the people. They're devouring God's word. They celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And we're told by the end of chapter 8 that their joy is very great. There's a revival of joy. There's a revival of God's word in their lives. They've been reading the scriptures all month. They've been binging on it. And then you get to chapter 9, And it's a few days after the Feast of Tabernacles, and it opens with the people gathered together for an assembly in Jerusalem, and they've clothed themselves with sackcloth and ashes and dust. They're mourning, and we're told about a day where they read the Bible for a quarter of the day, and as they've read from the book of the Law of Moses, they're overwhelmed with repentance. As they've spent time in the scripture, certainly they've seen that they've broken the covenant and they come before God to appeal to him. And Nehemiah chapter nine is this beautiful prayer that they lay out before God. It's one of the longest prayers in the scriptures. It's 38 verses, the whole chapter. 26 of the verses deal with the historical reality of Genesis through Deuteronomy, of the vast majority of the Old Testament up to the book of Nehemiah, 26 verses of praying through their own history, 24 of them focus on what God had done for them. That's 92% of their confession and their repentance. And eight verses focus on their disobedience, which is about 30% of their prayer of confession. So there's a lesson there for us as well. 
When you come before the Lord with sackcloth and ashes in a spirit of mourning or despair, do you spend the vast majority of time in your confession declaring what is true of God, 92%? Or do you spend the vast majority of it living in the 8% where you've completely botched it and missed the mark? They come before him and they open with a blessing about God's activity towards man. And we're not going to read the whole passage, but let me just read you a sampling. We'll start at verse 5, halfway through. Uh, You can see it paraphrased in your Bibles, and it starts like this. This is the whole assembly seeking God, praying before God, and the Levites say this. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host. The earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is in them, you give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. You found his heart faithful to you, And you made a covenant with him to give his descendants the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Girgashites. You have kept your promise because you are righteous. You saw the suffering of our ancestors in Egypt. You heard their cry at the Red Sea. You sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his officials and all the people of his land. For you knew how arrogantly the Egyptians treated them. You made a name for yourself, which remains to this day. You divided the sea before them so that they passed through it on dry ground. But you hurled their pursuers into the depths like a stone into mighty waters. By day you led them with a pillar of cloud and by night with a pillar of fire to give them light on the way they were to take. You came down on Mount Sinai. You spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations and laws that are just and right and decrees and commands that are good. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and gave them commands, decrees, and laws through your servant Moses. In their hunger, you gave them bread from heaven, and in their thirst, you brought them water from the rock. You told them to go in and take possession of the land. You had sworn with uplifted hand to give them. Just in those nine verses alone, 28 times, they declare the greatness of who God is. You created the heavens and the earth. You are the one who called our ancestor Abraham and promised him the land we are now living in. You are the one who called Moses and sent him to liberate us from our suffering. You saw our suffering. You came down. You let us out. You entered into relationship with us. You established your law with us, your covenant, your faithfulness with us. The first nine verses are all about what God has done on behalf of the Israelites. They open their prayer of confession saying, Lord, you're the only reason we even know about you. You did it all. We did nothing. And then in verse 16, a word is spoken that's repeated in verse 26 and 28 as well, and it's the word, but... But they, our forefathers, became arrogant and stiff-necked and did not obey your commands. They refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. They became stiff-necked and in their rebellion appointed a leader in order to return to their slavery. Verses 16 and 17 are a great description of what sin does in our life. It breeds an arrogance within us. Arrogance literally means having or displaying a sense of overbearing self-worth or self-importance. When self becomes the idol of our lives and it's elevated even in the place of God, the danger of sin is that it makes God really small in our eyes as though we're entitled to him doing things for us. Anybody who has had a child and raised children knows the reality of those five symptoms. Arrogance, stiff neck, disobedient to commands, refused to listen, failed to remember what you asked them to do. If you're a parent in the room, you know that reality. 
It sets in at a young age. Anybody who's worked with children knows that the sinful nature comes preloaded. It's like a software in the operating system, amen? And when you study their journey through the desert in the book of Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you see the hardness of heart of the people. God has done everything for them. And even right after the Red Sea, when the Egyptian army was bearing down on them and God parted the Red Sea and they walked through, when God provided manna for them in the desert, they refused to listen to his commands. They gathered some and tried to keep it overnight. Now imagine a million people keeping some overnight, and in the morning it turns into maggots. The smell would be unbearable in the camp when you have a million people, and let's say 30% of them did that. So there was a refusal to listen, a, a elevated self-importance among the people. God had done everything for them, but they failed to remember the miracles, and it culminates in their disobedience when to the, they get to the edge of the promised land and reject God completely. And we read those verses, and we might read through the stories and think to ourselves, how is that possible? But then we remember our own lives as well. We look at our own Christian journey and recognize that the same patterns that exist in these two verses can also manifest themselves in our own experience. God had done everything for Israel. He had brought them to the edge of the promised land, kicking and screaming along the way, and they had set their hearts on meat. They had set their hearts on being comfortable. They had set their hearts on all kinds of things. And when they get to the edge of the promised land, a rebellion ensues. It's a crescendo of their disobedience. They send in 40 spies. They go and look at the land. Ten of them come back and say, the land will devour us. We cannot go up. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, say, the Lord will give this into our hands. The Lord has promised it to us. Let's go up and take it. This is what I do find amazing. I don't judge them for this, but I do find it interesting. When they were in Egypt, enslaved and helpless, what did they do to deliver themselves? Absolutely nothing. God did it all for them. When they got to the Red Sea and the Egyptian army was pressing in on them and they had nowhere to go, the vast military might of the ancient Near East, they were a, a military superpower pressing in on them. What did they do? Moses says to the people, the Lord will fight for you. You just need to be still. Raises his staff. The Red Sea parts. They walk through on dry ground. Pharaoh and his army pursue into the water, and the waters close up on them, and they're drowned, never to see them again. This all takes place. They were there. They saw it. And they get to the edge of the promised land, and God has declared, I will give this to you. And they become overwhelmed with what they see, what they hear from the report of the spies. Now, you have to understand, when this is taking place, there is a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night behind them. Now think about all this. You saw God deal with the vast military empire of Egypt. Drown them in the sea. You didn't have to do anything. God has miraculously provided food and water for you. Every day you wake up, there's manna on the ground, somehow. And there is a pillar of cloud and fire, and you're somehow doubting that God is sufficient to lead you into what he has promised to give you, how is that possible? Sin and disobedience can have an institutionalizing effect on our minds and our hearts. Let me explain what I mean by that. There was a young man I knew who was getting in trouble with the law at the age of, well, throughout his teen years, and then at 18 was sent into adult court and sentenced to jail. His first jail term was a number of years. He got out at about the age of 24 and started to reoffend, started to get addicted to drugs, and this went on and on and on. And he was about 35 years old, and he had been in jail for the better part of his life from 18 years old. When he got out of prison at 35, on the day of his release, he went straight to a bank, held it up, 
and waited for the police to come arrest him. He had become institutionalized. He was free physically, legally, but his mind and his heart and his life was still a prisoner, a slave to prison life. When the Israelites get to the edge of the promised land, God's done everything for them. They are free physically from their slavery to Pharaoh in Egypt, but they are mentally still enslaved, thinking because of their desires for the things of Egypt, their doubt of who God is, and their disbelief that he's powerful enough to bring them into the fullness of his promise for them, they're still slaves to Egypt by the time they get to the promised land. And the reality is, sometimes in our own Christian life, we can be no different than the Israelites. God has set you free But still somewhere, you doubt the reality of that. You can get focused in on the 8% and forget the 92%. And this is what happens with them. The prayer goes on in verses 17 through 21. They begin to recall God's faithfulness. Despite their rebellion in the wilderness and, and their wandering, God remained faithful to his people. In verse 19, we read this. Because of your great compassion, you did not abandon them in the wilderness. By day, the pillar of cloud did not fail to guide them on their path, nor the pillar of fire by night to shine on the way they were to take. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold your manna from their mouths, and you gave them water for their thirst. Verse 21, for 40 years, you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out nor did their feet become swollen. Again, in a few choice verses, nine times they confess God's activity towards them. Lord, even in our rebellion, you were good to us. You instructed us. You walked with us. You provided for us. Even in our disobedience, you remained with us. I find that both comforting and terrifying at the same time. Comforting because I'm reminded of God's compassion towards us, that even in our disobedience, he doesn't throw us away. He remains with us. But I also find it terrifying because the reality is they're not living in the fullness of all God's, God had for them. They fell short. They were disobedient and didn't believe he could bring them into the promised land. So they're, they're, they're experiencing a spirituality of God that's just short of all he had for them. And I look at my own life and I go, am I, am I living in the fullness of all that God has for me? Or do we settle for an experience of who he is? And yes, he's with us. And yes, he's still caring for us. But it's not the fullness of all that he has for us. For 40 years, they're in that place. And then the author continues to unpack the history of Israel and talks about, in verses 22 through 25, after God's faithfulness to them in the wilderness, they're led in, and we get into the book of Judges. In verse 26, we read this, another B word, but they were disobedient and rebelled against you. They put your law behind their backs. They killed your prophets committed awful blasphemies, verse 27, so you handed them over to their enemies. And you read through the book of Judges, they would disobey and drift from God, and then the enemy would be permitted to come into the land, pillage it of all its fruitfulness, and then exit the land after the harvest was taken, and people would be starving. It's a metaphor for our spiritual lives. If we drift from God and we become disobedient, the enemy's allowed to press in and steal all the fruitfulness all of the joy to oppress us. And you see this pattern throughout the book of Judges, and we're told in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 28, when they cried out to you again, and when they cried out to you again, you heard from heaven, and in your compassion, you delivered them time after time after time. What you notice as you read through Nehemiah chapter 9 is that there's increasing levels of disobedience. And connected to it is increasing levels of discipline, leading right up to the exile. There was consequences attached to their decisions. And for 40 years in the wilderness, they suffered the consequences of their choice to 
disbelieve God and the promise he had for them. This is what I find so crazy about Nehemiah chapter 9. They spend their whole prayer recalling God's faithfulness, all that he's done on their behalf, and every generation's inability to be obedient to the covenant. And then, in verse 32 through 38, Nehemiah and the gang in Jerusalem focus their attention on their current reality, that they're living in the land, but they live in subjection to kings and leaders who tax them and take their produce, and they lay a request before God. Basically, they're saying, God, do you see us? Could you do it again? Could you liberate us? Could you free us? Could you deal with these taxes and these kings? And then they say these words in verse 38. In view of all this, in view of all of our history in this pattern of disobedience, in view of all this, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders, our Levites, and our priests are affixing their seals to it. And all of Nehemiah chapter 10 contains their commitment to be obedient to the covenant, to the law. This is what I find just completely mystifying to me. How did you recall generations of God's faithfulness met by your ancestors' inability to be faithful back and think that somehow it's going to be different for you? Oh, because you're putting it in writing. And and God, we're going to fix a seal to it just to make sure it's really legitimate. We're going to double down. We're going to try harder. We're going to be really, really good. And if we are, could could you liberate us again? 92% of Nehemiah chapter 9's prayer is about all the faithfulness of God. When you got to the end of it, wouldn't you think the natural conclusion would have been, Lord, you have been faithful. We've been a complete mess. Thank you. Hallelujah. And we rest in the good of who you are. No. Lord, we're going to double down. We're going to do better. We're going to try harder. And we see the same thing in the Apostle Peter on the night that Jesus was betrayed. Lord, even if all others fall away, James, John, Bartholomew, Alphaeus, yeah, they'll fall away, but I never will. He's sincere, he's devoted, he's trying his hardest, and he denies Christ three times hours later. I do not do what I want to do, but what I hate to do, this I keep on doing, and we can get stuck in that place. And the reason I called this message the insanity of trying harder is because Albert Einstein was famous for saying this quote, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. These guys recall the whole history of their people. They see a pattern of doing it over and over again, and then instead of just thanking God for his grace at work in their lives, they double down and put it in writing and fix a seal to it, saying, we're going to do better. Nehemiah chapter 9 is a beautiful confession of God's faithfulness, God's power, God's provision. And when you read through the stories of the characters who are mentioned, people like Abraham, God comes to him and he says, leave your family, leave your country, leave everything you know. Follow me and I will bless you. I will make your name great. What does Abraham do? He believes that what God said he could do, he would do. And he leaves and he follows him. And we're told in scriptures that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Moses hears God say, go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses believes God and sees it happen. He lives in the good of who God is, God's power, God's resources, God's strength to deliver his people. It's not Moses trying to work it up for God. Joshua gets to the edge of the promised land and like Caleb, says, God has promised this to us. 
Let us enter into the things that he has promised to us. He believed God. When you study the stories of Abraham, Moses, and Joshua, it wasn't about what they did. Their confidence was deposited in who God is. And you see that trend throughout the Old Testament, and as you read through Nehemiah chapter 9, 92% of it's focused on everything that God does. But Nehemiah and the group focus on the 8% of where they botched it, and then think that doubling down, putting it in writing, and fixing their seals to it is somehow going to change that trend line. Now, next week, we're going to be looking at Nehemiah chapter 10 a bit and spending the vast majority of our time in chapter 13 to see how that works out for them. And I'll just give you a spoiler alert. It's one of the most anticlimactic endings to a book you've ever read. Lord, I promise. We'll see how that works out, but the evidence isn't good. So I want to ask you, church, and I want you to think about this this week. Do you live in the 92% where you celebrate what he's done for you, his power, his spirit, his strength? Or are you focused on the 8% where no matter how hard you try, you just keep doing it over and over again, expecting different results? We need to move into Romans chapter 8 where the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death, where I depend on the Holy Spirit's power at work. Tune in next week for the conclusion of this series. This is Living Truth. Yeah. Come on, church, let's lift our voice. Sing the splendor of a king. The splendor.